आपने मुझे कुछ बताया था कि होस्ट कैसे बन सकते हैं जो तो मुझे समझ में नहीं आ रहा था। एंड गो टू मोर सॉरी थिंक वो इसमें म्यूट और स्टॉप वीडियो के साथ है एंटर होस्ट की टू क्लेम होस्ट so i can only have participants record reactions chat um, share screen acha isme nahi hai acha fir let me do it then ठीक हो गया तो पिछले जो एम थे एएलएस वाले जो थे उसमें कैसा लोगों ने किया आई थिंक वी हैड अ डिसेंट रिस्पांस फ्रॉम द मेडिकल ऑफिसर्स एंड सीनियर ऑफिसर्स सीनियर मेडिकल ऑफिसर्स आई थिंक वी कैन मे बी जस्ट डिस्कस देम ओके हमाद डू यू हैव एनी क्वेश्चंस अबाउट द एमसीक्यूज Hamad is our uh, senior medical officer, and I think he did the MCQs. Did he? Yes, madam. I have uh, done MCQ. It uh, it will be better if you can provide us uh, with a manual about uh, different scenarios uh, because uh, uh, then in routine practice we can go through it. So, what do you mean in in the form of a uh, a booklet a, or a book? Uh, yes, madam. If there is any booklet, it would be of uh, great help. So there are in lots future, of uh, in... online online uh, modules and you know the online MCQs which you can do uh, and there and then see the response. Um, yes, ma'am. I can share that website um, on the, yes, the link on the on the group. 
and there are lots of options that you can select and select the, op the topic and carry on doing. Just give me one minute, please. Oh. Um, Hamad, I also have some, um, you can say, pocket handouts for um, these um, cards for ACLS. I can uh, share with you. You can photocopy or I can actually maybe take a picture and uh, distribute in the, um, in the, and there is also another uh, one copy of the ACLS protocols in the emergency room uh, folder that we have created for our ED resource. Uh, it's in the drawer uh, in the in, in the main desk area. Okay. So did you? Sorry, I missed that. Did you create the folder already with the guidelines? I have created the folder that uh, we discuss about the topics, and okay. uh, I have some ACLS protocol that I actually I got ACLS certified in January. So I have uh, these okay. uh, protocols. Okay. There are uh, yes. six protocols. The algorithms, yes. These are six protocols that I can share with them. And it's actually a copy of that is also in that folder. Yeah, I think and that's I very actually, important. Yeah, I'll, I'll share that. You any, any ER book, if you have Washington manual, if you have any Oxford manual, they should have these ACLS protocols in them as well. So you can get it from there and I'll put that in the ER folder too. And if you also write on the Research Council UK, um, if you write on the computer, Google, just search that the algorithms and then you can see the same algorithms which are actually in the manual because we follow the Research mm -hmm. Council. <clears throat> of UK, so there are lots of things in that. But yes, um, the, the MCQs that I just, you know, picked up few from the website, which are relevant, which were relevant with the ACLS. So that's why I just made that. <clears throat> but I can share the website where you can, in your free time, just carry on doing the normal MCQs and see the answers. Thank you, madam. I think, Thank you, madam. I think we should start. Um, uh, Shall we start? Anybody has any? Yeah, anybody has any questions about the MCQs? I gave you the key uh, on Monday. So Rana and uh, Hamad. Can you please open your, show your, um, open your camera, turn your camera on so that we can see as well. So EMO stands for, thank you. Emergency medical officer. Emergency medical officer. And SMO is senior medical officer, I believe. Yeah. <clears throat> Senior medical officer has finished at least four years of training. Um, mm -hmm. Medical officers are after house job and they are in the process of training. Some have done one, two, three years, but they have, haven't done four years yet. Rana, how okay. many years of training? Fourth year training, sir. Fourth year training, very good. So today we decided to talk about ACS, acute coronary syndrome, and patient when what should we do when the patient present with chest pain. So again, it's a very big topic. Um, it depends on what's the age of the patient um, and how they are presenting, in what state they are in. So. Um, I think the main thing is that you have to be, you, do, you don't have to be um, dismissive about the fact that it can be something serious. The main thing that you need to pick up is whether this is a life-threatening condition or not. So 
when the patient presents, first of all, um, and for example, if I say a 60 year old gentleman comes in and he says that he's got a chest pain. So Mohammed, uh, can you tell me how would you approach? How will you start your consultation with the patient? I think your name is Hamad, but I can only see Mohammed written. Yeah, Mohammed Hamad. Yes, ma'am. Uh, when so, the patient presents... Uh, so, for example, I'm a 60-year-old woman, and I'm just coming to the emergency department, and I've got chest pain. So, how will you come to me and start the consultation and think that I'm the patient? Uh, I will, ma'am, first, uh, uh, I will quickly take out the history of the patient. I will determine the uh, nature and severity of the chest pain. Uh, First of all, there is a, can I just uh, stop you here? Can I just stop you here? Yes, ma'am. So when you approach the patient, mm -hmm. first of all, you need to introduce yourself. Yes, ma'am. Do you do yes, that? Yes, ma'am. I will introduce uh, myself. Yes, ma'am. Right. So that's very important. You tell the patient who you are, and what's your name, and what's yes, your role, so that they know who they are talking to, and then you confirm the patient's ID yes. as well. These things which I'm telling yes, you, these are very important when you go for the exams in your coming years or um, it's a good practice anyway, but when you go for the exam, these yes, are the little things that are picked up when you see you know, patient doctor interaction. So tell your patient your name and then say that you are one of the doctors. So the patient knows that you are the doctor and make sure that you're seeing the right yes, patient. Okay, go on then. Can you turn on your camera because I'm just talking to the screen. Uh, uh, Madam, uh, first of all, I will introduce myself and I will also ask uh, the patient to introduce uh, himself or herself. Then uh, I will uh, describe my role uh, that I am uh, her concerned physician. Uh, then I will ask uh, quickly uh, take the uh, history about uh, side nature and intensity of uh, her chest pain. Uh, then I will uh, quickly do the examination of this patient. And uh, first of all, I will check the vitals, and then I will uh, do the remaining examination of this patient. If uh, uh, patient is having typical uh, chest pain. Uh, uh, and then uh, uh, in, if, if, if there is chest pain, then I will do the ECG and chest X-ray of this patient. They, uh, okay, first Let, of all, I'll stop you uh, here. If... I'll stop you here. So let's talk about more about the typical chest pain that you are saying. So whenever you take the history, the cardiac sounding chest pain, normally people say, oh, it's cardiac sounding chest pain or suspicious cardiac chest pain. Can you tell me the features of yes, what sir. makes you think that this is cardiac sounding? Because normally, I think 80% yeah. of your diagnosis is already dependent on what the history you get. Do you agree? Yes, ma'am. So the yes, history is very, very important. Um, the nature of the pain, you said all the right things, but can you just explain that what cardiac sounding chest pain is like? Uh, cardiac sounding chest pain, madam, it includes uh, a patient is having uh, central uh, pressing in nature, chest pain, and uh, a patient is also it is radiating to the uh, left uh, upper limb neck, or patient is having uh, associated uh, sweating, vomiting, or nauseated feeling, and uh, uh, he or her is apprehending doom that something bad will happen then uh, it is highly likely that uh, the pain is your cardiac in, uh, origin. Okay. And so onset of pain, yes. What time did it start? How did it start? Was it sudden or gradual? Did it start at rest or what were yes, they doing? So you really want to know the whole circumstances, mm -hmm. um, how the pain actually started, what the patient was doing at that time. Were they doing exercise? Were they just sitting? or you know the the nature and what happened when the pain started what the patient did the, were they concerned were they initially not concerned or immediately they they sat down and what made it better um you know where was it going whether it was radiating to the neck shoulder it not always necessary to the left arm it can also radiate towards the right arm um tightness in the jaw neck 
you know, that also is a part of that tightness, or like a pressure on the chest. Yes. So these are very key features, which you suspect from the cardiac sounding chest pain. Then you talk about the severity. How do you, how do you ask the severity in normal pain, not just the cardiac chest pain? Rana, can you tell me, if you want to know the severity of the patient, what, what tool do you use? Rana, can you hear me? Hassan? Yes, ma'am. Uh, if we want to determine the... Can you hear me, ma'am? Yes, I can. Ma'am, if we want to determine the severity of the patient... Uh, I'm sorry, actually, I don't think you can see me because... Uh, I think you can because I'm driving actually car. Uh, if you want to see the severity of the uh, disease of the pain that patient is experiencing, normally what we do is pain scale that uh, ranges from uh, zero to ten. That how severe is it uh, from mild pain to bone crushing pain? So the patient uh, we have a smiley face uh, as leading to a very grumpy, uh, crying face. Kiss severity ka pain over there. Uh, exactly. patient can we easily tell so visual, us, visual analog don't have that pain scale so visual uh -huh. analog right so you see the patient are they looking comfortable the sitting or are they looking uncomfortable and then you ask the scale out of 10 what's the severity of the pain so they say okay my pain is 8 out of 10 and they are actually looking um, sweaty and you see their clamminess if there is any so you assess the nature of the pain um, the severity and if there are any associated symptoms what can they be ma'am exactly as dr hamad told already that, that there should be a feeling of impending doom there should be feeling of uh, nauseous or vomiting patient can feel that as well as well as there's profuse sweating uh, patient uh, campaign, just like you said, it's not necessarily radiating only to the left side. It may radiate to right side, or it may as well just be central chest pain, which is gripping and swear and sudden uh, in onset okay. usually, uh, and it improves right. with the rest normally, but not necessarily. So in all right. such uh, in all such conditions, we must, uh, keep our suspicion high as patient of having uh, cardiac pain. Okay. So from the starting point of when the chest pain started to coming up to the emergency department, you have to, you have to gauge the whole knowledge of what exactly happened in the meantime. So duration, um, when did they decide to come to hospital? How did they come to hospital? Did they have any aspirin? Did they make any difference? Was there any GTN given? Did that make any difference? So these are all the tools that you can, you can, you, they can help to assess that whether this pain is cardiac sounding. Then you go for rest of the history because that's also very important. Asya, rest of the history, what do you ask? I don't know if Asya is there. Rana. So I'm not sure whether people are there I'll or not. Them. I'll answer you for them. Can you repeat the question, please? So, so you have taken the history, um, yeah. initial presenting complaint. Then what are yeah. the further things that you're going to ask? That will help uh, to make, you, make your diagnosis. Yeah, if there is any past event that has happened just like that, so the patient can relate better to, or there are comorbids that we need to ask okay, if there is hypercholesterolemia, hyperlipidemia history, if there is any history of hypertension, if there's any history of diabetes mellitus or any compounding factor for that matter that may have led to this situation yeah. or any uh, exercise that he has gone under gone which he normally does not or any stress that he has undergone because cardiac origin may be as well be ACS or it may be like, like patient we have experienced stress induced uh, syndrome or something like that so we need to ask certain so, points that uh, may, uh, Sati, because uh, cardiac pain uh, say for example as we have discussed already uh, the central chest pain is 
if vitals also indicate that there's high blood So I think we just lost his voice. Um, can anybody hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. So yes, so we have established that this pain is cardiac sounding in nature. Um, patient may or may not have any past medical history of similar pain or any previous cardiac history, or if they have any like previous cabbage or previous MIs or previous history. So that will add another point. Then you normally take the history that you normally take, like medications, allergies, smoking, um, and uh, you know the, the normal history. They then come to the examination. You look, you see what the patient is looking like. You check their vitals, um, and then you examine. So at this point, Muhammad um, Hamad, aap batayein ke. Yes, I history hai patient ki central crushing chest pain has said you are seeing the patient at six o'clock in the morning and the patient had pain started at two o'clock in the morning which, which woke him up from sleep and it was central it was tight uh, radiating to the right arm neck jaw so you have got all the good factors so you're seeing him at six o'clock in the morning so what 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 investigations would you like to do oh, bye. Uh, madam, uh, first of all, uh, I will do the EKG of the patient. Then uh, I will uh, say at the same time, I will send uh, his or her baseline investigations, which include uh, general functions, uh, CBC, uh, LFTs. Then uh, I will also uh, send cardiac enzyme profile. Uh, and mostly uh, we do uh, troponin I and CKMB. Uh, in our setup, uh, uh, at some time we also send uh, CPK along with them. Uh, and then uh, sometimes the uh, patient present uh, symptoms overlap between uh, acute uh, pancreatitis. Uh, sometimes patient present with uh, epigastric pain. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, that's perfect. Well done. Yes, sir. Uh, we will also, I will also uh, uh, check for serum lipase and amylase levels. Uh, these are the madam initial investigation mm -hmm. I would like to do in this patient. So while you are waiting for the investigations that you have sent, that you've got cardiac sounding yes, chest pain and you have got, yes, say for example, normal ECG in front of you and patient is now pain free. So the patient pain yes, duration was say 20 minutes. And now he's yeah. pain yes, free and the ECG is normal. So yes, how would you how would you proceed? Uh, if my pain is of uh, less than 30 minutes duration, then it uh, may be due to angina uh, or due to some other factor. Uh, uh, and then, madam, uh, if uh, we will uh, uh, we okay. may, may do a echocardiogram. A patient has typical chest pain, but of less than 30 minutes duration that then in order to determine the nature of the pain, we, we, we may uh, do exercise tolerance tests of that patient. Okay. Or so I think you've gone a little bit far test. because echo and exercise tolerance tests are not the test that you do in the emergency department, don't you? Yes, ma'am. This is something yes, that you need to follow it up for. So now... The way we treat ACS here is, as I sent you the protocols, if you look at those and follow those, there is a red pathway, there's a yellow pathway, and there's a green pathway. So let's do the red pathway first, which is easy. Um, and that includes only cardiac sounding chest pain with ST elevation in the ECG. So, so you have seen the patient, you, have, you were suspicious on the history. So you give patient 300 milligrams of aspirin straight away, no matter what. You don't need to wait for the blood results. 80% of your diagnosis is based on the clinical history. So you give aspirin anyway, it's not going to harm, but it would rather give beneficial effects. So sooner you give the aspirin, 
300 milligrams, it can be sublingual or you know, dispersible aspirin. So then it will affect, that will have a good effect. So you give them, and then if it's an ST elevation MI, then obviously you need to do something sooner rather than later. So that would be, these days we do PCI immediately. So you have to refer a patient to somewhere else if you do not have the facility of PCI in your hospital. You give patient Fonda Perinox, the, I don't know which blood thinners, do you use clopidogrel 300 milligrams? Um, depending on if the patient is already on warfarins, then only in that case, you have to wait for their INR. So you do not want to give too many blood thinners. Um, for fundoperinox, have you used, um, Ali Ashraf, have you got fundoperinox that you give subcutaneously in your department? It's, uh, it's on formulary here. Uh, so yes, we can do it. We usually use Clexane, which is enoxaparin here. Uh, most likely okay. subcutaneously, one milligram per kilogram, sub-Q twice a day. Yeah, but you can get drip in ICU. We don't have a corner so, okay. unit here. So some sort of um, you know blood thinner that patient needs at that stage, you give them and try and refer them sooner. Make sure that they're pain free. You give them morphine. You can give them GTN infusion depending on their blood pressure. It may not drop. So that is the the serious pathway. The right pathway is the main one that you have seen the ST elevation and they need to have immediately need something doing because they are actually have blocked artery or blocked vessel which is stopping the blood supply to the heart and then actually is called an ST elevation MI. Then it comes to yellow pathway. So these are the patients who, who have got cardiac sounding chest pain and they have got abnormal ECG. So your suspicion on the, on the history was 80% you were sure that is cardiac sounding chest pain. Then you've got some T wave abnormalities or maybe ST depression T-wave inversions, um, or these only these abnormal ECG changes, then you put them on the yellow pathway. So yellow pathway, if you have looked on these uh, the guidelines that I have sent you, in that case, you again give aspirin, and then you give um, clopidogrel or clexane, uh, whatever is in your hospital, and then do the chest X-ray, make sure they're not in the heart failure, and tyrofibin and other things that can be used. But these kind of patients should be going to CCU um, and they should be on a cardiac monitor because their rhythm can change. They can go into VT, they can go into ST elevation. So you, you see the changes. So whenever the patient you take first, hist uh, first ECG, it's also very important to repeat the ECG um, if patient has got ongoing chest pain or if it's a cardiac sounding chest pain. Um, I know that your patient, your department is not that busy, but in our case, um, when the patient comes, they get triaged. So first they come to us, the ECG, we see the ECG without seeing the patient. So when the nurse brings the ECG to us, they tell us a little bit more history. If that history is suggestive of maybe this cardiac sounding chest pain, we ask them to repeat the ECG because sometimes you, you may see a normal ECG in the first time, but after 15, 20 minutes, when you repeat the ECG, there might be some changes. So those changes would be dynamic changes. If somebody is developing or if, they, if the MI is evolving, then you might see the changes then. So only one ECG is not enough. Um, so the less, less suspicious patients, uh, the green pathway, I think, is the most commonly seen. And it's basically used to rule out if there's any cardiac sounding history. So this, these kind of patients who will need, I mean, the yellow pathway and red pathway, they definitely need to come to hospital for further management. But the tricky ones are the green ones, the green pathway, which is basically you are ruling out um, any cardiac sounding pain or if there's any cardiac damage. And these are could be young patients, like in their 40s or 30s, when you are, the, the history is borderline, their ECG is normal, and their cardiac enzymes are normal as well. So, but you're still worried about their chest pain. So in that case, 
you really want to make sure that this event was not cardiac cardiac related and these can be the young patients or with normal ecg um, and they will need a follow up as an outpatient so these kind of follow up um, we have special chest pain clinics where we bring them so they don't need to stay in hospital for further investigations but you can't leave them you know if i say i had a chest pain for 15 minutes and i may not have any risk factors but i'm i'm late 40s and i have my mother has got diabetes and my father is hypertensive and it could be my first time you know in in our population in our race um, we are more likely to have cardiac events so that's very important that you may not miss that opportunity to pick up the first ever episode of the chest cardiac sounding chest pain or any insult to the myocardium or heart related pain so these are the ones who have got suspicious history and pain free normal ecg but you really still don't want to make sure you still really don't want to miss the diagnosis so you bring them back so in that case you have to make sure that you do the chest x ray which is normal then you do the blood test including the troponin which is normal and um the the follow up ecg which is again normal and in that case you make sure the other the other di differentials need to be ruled out as well it's not just the cardiac pain that you need to pick up you need to make sure that can it be something else so in this case what are the other differentials that you have to rule out before you say okay it's nothing you know it's it's not a serious pain because you can't just send the patient home without telling that there is nothing what are the, what are the other things that you may need to rule out in say in in a young patient in their early 40s or late 40s or maybe you know even even earlier i have seen people having st elevation mis in their age of 35 in pakistan so it's not uncommon so if you don't see any ecg changes um then what are the other risk other differentials you would want to rule out anyone uh, madam uh, uh, it can be due to aortic dissection uh, good uh, apd uh, and acid okay. it can be due to acid peptic disease due to pancreatitis or it can be due to musculoskeletal Uh, it can be musculoskeletal in a region yes so it can be so basically when you your aim is not to be dismissive you have to make sure that this is not something life threatening gastritis yes. it may sound like a gastritis but remember that gastritis is not the diagnosis to be made in the emergency department without ruling out the other life threatening problems for example i can see that oh yes patient has got burning chest pain they are slightly tender in the epigastrium they say oh i had a very big meal last night and i went to bed so it sounds like oh they may have got gastritis but this should be not on the first on your differentials gastritis is never a diagnosis of emergency medicine so unless you have ruled out dissection unless you have ruled out acs you have ruled out pneumothorax in young patients by doing a chest x ray um you know you they 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 may be profusely vomiting earlier on and they can rupture their esophagus and they can have that sort of related chest pain they can be costochondritis pancreatitis like you said so and like i said before the green pathway is the very much the thing that you are trying to rule out the other causes before you say that this is something non serious so basically in the emergency department our job is to save life the life threatening emergencies we need to make sure that patient is not dying okay so if you don't rule out the other causes you can't just say that okay this is not something serious you have to do and for everything you have to do something for example for cardiac chest pain you have to do the troponin to rule out pneumothorax you have to do the chest x ray 
um, if there's any history, I have seen patients with having an MI and they are tender on their chest. So if they are tender on their chest, you cannot say it's a muscular pain without doing the troponin, right? Dissection, I know yeah. CT aorta is not very um, simple investigation that you request for. So you have to be very careful when you request that is this a you know sudden onset of pain. It's going through and through to your back. Um, you you may not find the bilateral different air blood pressures um, because that's always not the case. It can be dissection type A or type B. So it can be there but may not be leaking. So these are all the factors that you need to keep in mind. So when you don't know when the patient is looking well and they have got no, not many risk factors. So basically you rule out the other things and then say, yes, this patient is now safe. After that, if you say that, yes, this patient is safe, I don't think it's a heart attack. I don't think it's a pneumothorax. I don't think it's a ruptured esophagus or any other major cause that can, that can lead him to have any significant effect then you need to decide whether do I need to do any further investigations as an outpatient or not? Shall I leave this patient in the air or just let him go? Or shall I just do something more? But that may not be as an inpatient, but that can be as an outpatient. How much time you can give them? So in that case, you have to, uh, the one heart score that I have sent you. So you calculate their risk factors. Um, I think the one that I sent you, you don't need to memorize all the numbers that is that are written there. You, you have all got mobile. So if you write heart scores in that, so it will tell you how suspicious was the history and you give them mark. Um, what's their ECG like? What's their troponin? What's the age risk factors? So you calculate how much factors they have got and it tells you at the end that if the patient scores from zero to three, then they may not need any follow-up. And if the patient scores, for example, three to five, then they need urgent follow-up, but may not be immediately. And if they are high in the risk, then they need the next day, or you, know, you need to bring them back very soon for the exercise tolerance, and then comes the echo and all that sort of further investigations that can be done as an outpatient, but not later, sooner. Are you all agree with me so far? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So yes, the other thing is the other thing is troponin. Um, troponin I that we use here is, um, as you all know, is the quite specific test because the other cardiac enzymes can be raised in any other situation like CKMB and. Um, LDH and other things, they can come from liver or from muscle or anywhere else. But troponin I is the most important one. And how soon after the chest pain, you can say safely that this troponin is normal. For example, like I said earlier, you, have, you are seeing a patient at six o'clock in the morning and the patient had chest pain at 12 o'clock and they're now pain free. So if you do the troponin at 6.30 in the morning, would that be diagnostic? Anyone? Uh, Madam, if levels are uh, rising, then it can be diagnostic. So the earliest you can detect troponin in your blood after having a cardiac event is six hours after the onset of pain, right? So if uh, you have seen uh, the some patient- Some literature, two to six hours. Sorry? Two to, two to, six, uh, two to six hours are mentioned. So- uh, So maximum, so the, you, min uh, you can't uh, go can for minimum, troponin, right? So the earliest is six hours. If you do before that, it can be misleading. So the peak time is six hours when you actually able to safely say that this troponin is normal or if this troponin is high, it is significant. 
So you have done this patient's blood at 6.30 in the morning. So it's more than six hours since they have had the pain. And if this troponin is negative, then yes, you can say this is not a cardiac related chest pain or and the ECG is normal um, and you can put them on a green side of the pathway. But if you are seeing somebody two hours after the onset of pain and they are pain free and you do their, their troponin at two hours and that comes as negative, would that be diagnostic? Uh, no, ma'am. No. no, because you need to repeat the troponin levels at six hours after the onset of pain. So the blood tests that you have done is two hours. So you need to repeat the blood tests um, after, since, you know, to make it six, more than six hours. And you basically see the trend. The, your first troponin was, I don't know which units do you use. Um, if the first drop is normal and the second drop after the six hours after the onset of pain is normal as well, then you are quite safe. Because basically in emergency department, we are not actually only saving patients, we are saving ourselves as well. Um, if you don't do these investigations and the, you send the patient home, they go home and they have an, a, a massive heart attack and they die, then I know that patients don't take it further or sue the doctors or you know do anything, but you should have grounds to stand. You should have the evidence. Um, you should have the evidence that you have done this to be sure that why did you discharge the patient or why did you not do this and why did you not do that? So basically, you save yourself as well at the same time with an evidence. So the evidence is you did their first drop and then you did their second drop six hours after the onset of pain and they both were negative. So you have got valid point to say that that's why I discharged the patient. You can't just say, oh, the patient pain was fine and he looked fine and his first drop, which you did at two hours after the onset of pain and that was normal, that is not enough. So you need to be following the guidelines. You repeat the troponin. So do you have any um, follow-up clinics for chest pain for such patients who are suspicious? We have uh, medicine follow-up clinics. We can use them. We can actually, they, we have a protocol that anybody who is, who is even discharged from the ER uh, is given a, an appointment for the medicine clinic either the next day or the day after to be seen. Okay. So in that case, you can't bring everybody back to the clinic, right? You can't increase that much workload. You have to think about whether this patient need, don't just routinely do this just because you are doing it and you have to do this. You have to be making sure that you are bringing the right patients back and the right investigation of choice can be done on the, on the specific patients who really need that. If you see a 25 year old female who has got 10 minutes of chest pain and you do their all blood test, would it be reasonable thing to do? And if the, you know, you can do an ECG, yes, but if the pain is not cardiac sounding, would, would you still be doing a troponin? No. Yes, so you have to decide. Troponin is not just um, a, a random thing that you would want to do on every single chest pain because troponin can be raised in patients who have got maybe uh, CKD, like in renal failure. Um, it can be raised in dissection. It can be raised in other things as well. So it may not necessarily be doing on every patient who comes and say that, oh, I... Uh, you know, you've got chest pain, so you need to have a troponin. You have to have, like I said before, 80% of your clinical suspicion is on the history. So you can't just do on every patient troponin. Yes, you do ECG. It's, it doesn't cost much. You need an ECG if somebody's got chest pain. Then you have to use your clinical judgment to make sure that whether you this patient needs a troponin or not. And just in case, if you have done the troponin, 
and the patient is pain free with the normal chest you know with the normal ecg and no cardiac risk factors with a heart score of 0 you don't need to bring them back do you obviously not mm. yes so every patient who comes to the emergency department who has got chest pain they don't necessarily need to come back you have to think about the clinics that the cardiologist are running it's not a free service you know you can't bring everybody back so you have to be very decisive of who who needs to come and that's come that's where it comes the heart scoring that's why they have created the scoring system so that you can pick up the right number of patients who are really deserving and who really need further investigations not just everyone does that make sense yes ma'am so this is this is all i think this is how you approach yes please ask questions uh madam uh, what is cut off level of uh, troponin i and ckmb in ckd patients to diagnose uh, acs so i have um, the, like i said uh, we use different levels um, different units here for our, for us is 12 i think troponin i exactly don't know exactly what units they have but 12 is the cut off and is slightly different for females and males and if if the cut off value has been decided then if it's slightly above the cut off value then it's abnormal and if you have got somebody who have got very borderline troponin and is not that high then and you were suspicious of cardiac chest pain the way they have described the pain and the ecg was normal you may want to keep them because that is not fulfilling your clinical suspicion like you have seen 60 year old male who were really cardiac sounding chest pain and his um, he was looking sweaty clammy and his first drop 6 hours after the onset of pain comes back negative i would be very reluctant to rely on that specific troponin i think i would want to keep them for another 6 hours and then repeat the troponin and see the trend okay because the first drop comes back because i need to treat my patient i'm not treating ecgs i'm not treating blood results i'm treating the patient so if the patient has got very significant chest pain and i was expecting it to be the troponin to be abnormal and it has come back negative so that would not satisfy me i would want to keep another few hours and then repeat the troponin and if that is also negative then you got plenty of time that that yes i have repeated the troponin even 12 hours and saw the trend and it was still negative and the patient is still pain free and only in that case i would be uh, happy that this is not a cardiac chest pain but then why the patient has got pain you need to find out other causes then you need to concentrate about dissection or you need to find out from the chest x ray whether something else is going on or if they are very suspicious in that case you can keep them in hospital and do it do an echo and do further to find out why they are having that pain so it it varies from the age group the way they present um and also you know pleuritic chest pain it can be pe um in young patients 35 year old maybe she was on oral contraceptive pills that can make her high risk of pe that can present slightly atypical chest pain then i would want to do a d dimer so d dimer is also something that we need to add but it's also very non specific test and we will talk about it separately because it's a whole dilemma that why would you want to do a d dimer and well score yes make uh, from a nephrology uh, perspective um, uh, hamad uh, from a nephrology perspective jo aam taur pe jo uh, troponin yes, raise hote hai na um, ckd mein early ckd mein ckd early stage 3a ckd mein troponin bahut rarely raise hote hai usually there is there are indeterminate they are slightly yes, high aur wo baat sahi hai dr bushra ki ki ji aap troponin ka trend dekhenge 
एकेजी के साथ भी पेशेंट के साथ भी और उसकी और ऐसे कोई पुरानी ट्रोपोनिन हुई है उसके साथ कोरिलेट कर लेंगे तो वो ट्रेंड के ऊपर डिपेंड करता है लेकिन इसमें अर्ली स्टेज थ्री ए में तो ऑलमोस्ट नॉर्मली रहता है तो क्लियरेंस ठीक है हाँ सी के डी फोर में सी के डी फाइव में आप यू कैन सी टू और थ्री टाइम एलिवेशन ऑफ ट्रोपोन लेकिन उसमें भी ट्रेंड सिमिलर रहेगा क्योंकि क्लियरेंस नहीं हो रही ना तो इसलिए वो exactly. जितना है उतना ही रहेगा सिक्स साल में लेकिन उसमें आपका अगर सस्पेशन हाई है तो देन यू विल एक्ट अपॉन इट कि आप बी के जी में और बाकी चीजें में करने में वो सब कुछ करेंगे आप उसका वो क्लिनिकल सिनेरियो पर डिपेंड करेगा सिर्फ ट्रोपोनिन पर डिपेंड नहीं करेगा तो बेसिकली आपने सर मैडम आई हैव अ क्वेश्चन इन आवर यूनिट वी यूज्ड टू डू सी के एम बी लेवल्स इफ दे आर रेज मोर देन थ्री टाइम्स देन वी यूज्ड टू वी कंसीडर दैट पेशेंट विद ईएसआरडी हैज सफर्ड एक्यूट माइओकार्डियल इंफेक्शन हाउ मच सी के एम बी इज सेंसिटिव इन डायग्नोसिंग एक्यूट माइ आई थिंक आई विल आई विल नॉट एज आई सेड आई विल नॉट जस्ट ट्रीट द ब्लड टेस्ट्स यू नीड टू कोरिलेट द होल सिचुएशन your your clinical judgment your clinical history your examination your ecg your blood test when they all combine together only then you can you can or you only then you can say that this is something that you need to treat or whether this is an mi or not only on the basis of ckmb raised but patient is sitting fine you had seen a normal ecg they had 20 minutes of chest pain and they are fine you can't just say that they had a heart attack can you without any risk factors so you have got a good history you have got good positive risk factors you have got maybe normal or abnormal ecg and on top of that you have got abnormal cardiac enzymes only then you can make the final diagnosis so basically you are treating them on the acs pathway that's why these pathways have been created so that you may not miss things so if you got clear cut st elevation you got good history or new onset of left bundle branch block and patient is sweaty clammy vomiting then yes they have had an mi if somebody is showing me an ecg of left bundle branch block and i don't have any previous notes to compare this ecg to um and patient is smiling laughing at me then uh, would i be thinking that this patient is having an mi no madam no so basically you are not treating the ecg you are treating your patient yes sir as compared to the one who is looking sweaty clammy is having chest pain and you see the ecg and it's showing left bundle branch block i can't say oh this is old left bundle branch block i don't need to worry about it you need to then think that oh yes this is he's having a heart attack so you combine the the story the examination the look your clinical judgment and the additional things is your investigations so you combine all of them together and fit them in one pathway and that would be the safer options these guidelines have been created to be on the safe side okay so sometimes you can't make a diagnosis but you have to do the initial management the initial treatment that is required to save the life or to prevent any comorbidity or to to, to prevent the deterioration of the patient that's why these pathways have been created to be safe okay okay any more questions okay ma'am i have a question about uh, grace score Uh, how do we use grace that score. Uh, in that uh, grace score is also uh, as when you do the heart score for the green chest pay pathway grace score is also the same thing if you write then i think the patient who need to come back or you want to assess the severity or the risk factors only in that case but if you if somebody is having 
an active MI in front of you, then you would not be wanting to calculate the gray score. If somebody has got abnormal ECG, they have given you the history, you are seeing an ST depression or a T wave inversion, then I think cal me calculating the gray score is not going to change the management. It's only for those patients who are suspicious, who you want to be careful about bringing them back or not. Um, similarly as hard scores, gray score, um, these are just to be the, to keep the patient on the safe pathway. If I don't do the scoring system and let them go home and don't do anything further, then I think I might lose that patient if something significant happens because it's not about just only this episode. If this episode is negligible or disappears after 10, 20 minutes and we don't do the scoring system, maybe the next time, they have even further severe episode and we haven't done the scoring before. So we, we haven't done the investigations that, which were needed. So the grow gray score and hard score comes then when your patient is looking good, they, you can discharge them, but you want to do some investigations to find out then they end up with a high score. They will end up going having an echo, NGO, and then you might find abnormality on those investigations and they become high risk then. Because everybody, okay. you know, in first time, there is always a first time. So first time, if somebody is presenting with the non-specific symptoms, and it can be hard problem, but we may not be able to pick them up if we don't do these scoring systems. So scoring systems are helping us to, to, to detect any severity or any high risk factors which are underlying. Okay. So make sure in young patients, we rule out pulmonary embolisms, which we will talk separately. Um, young patients can have pneumothorax that can present with a similar chest pain. You may not see lower SATs. You may not be able to feel the reduced air entry on one side because it can be small, spontaneous. So that's why you do the chest X-ray and find out from there if there is not any. So basically, you do the tick box thing that, okay, this is not chest pain, troponin is normal, ECG is normal. Okay, chest X-ray is fine. This is not a pneumothorax. So amylase is normal. So this is not a pancreatitis. So you rule out all the life-threatening things or the worrying things. And when you don't, when you are left with nothing, then you may say it can be a gastritis. Okay, but gastritis would not be on top of my list. Okay. Okay. Any more questions? <clears throat> so I have got, I think um, I tried to get some MCQs. I've got not many, but just a little. So if I read that. Can you share your screen? Uh, yeah, I think I can. Let me just do that. <clears throat> Can you see? Yes. He's so a 52 year old man. And also I think the ECG criteria, I'm sure you all know how to read the ECGs. Only one lead abnormality is not considered significant. You have to have two or maximum three consecutive leads to show any abnormality that you want to pick up, um, especially for ST elevations. So a 52-year-old man has three millimeter ST elevation in V2 to V4. Chest pain has been relieved with sublingual GTN. Blood pressure is 135 over 82 and heart rate is 62 per minute. Which of the following treatments would, you, would be appropriate for this patient? So 
would you give calcium channel blockers IV, Mohammed? Uh, no, madam. No. Yeah, there's no role for that. Transcutaneous pacing at 80 per minute. You want to do the False. temporary pacing? False. False. Patient heart no, rate madam. is fine. Patient no. blood pressure is fine. So we don't need the pacing. No. Percutaneous coronary intervention, PCI. Yes, madam. If, uh, uh, if madam, uh, elevations are uh, persistent, then this is a treatment of choice. Yes. So yes, you would do. And fibrinolytics, yes, you will give. Right? Yes, ma'am. So yes, that's and that's the next question is you can you see the ECG? Yes, sir. The fifty-two-year-old gentleman presents with a crushing chest pain. He states that this pain is worse. This is the worst pain he could ever have. Blood pressure is one hundred and ten over fifty-eight, and Sats are ninety-three percent on air or um, O2. Yes, or it doesn't say whether he was on oxygen or not. You gain IV access and connect to the monitor. Which of the following statements is correct? So you see this rhythm strip. This is normal sinus rhythm. Yes. That makes you think you've got P waves, you have got normal QRS complexes, yes, and you can see the T wave. And if you measure that, it looks regular. So this is normal sinus rhythm. Patient is stable and oxygen is not necessary. Yes, when saturation is okay. Saturation is not okay. 93% on air is not okay. 94? We should keep it above 94%. 95. In a, in a young, healthy person, they should be above 95% on air. So 93% oxygen is less. So on a 52-year-old gentleman, if the SATs are 93, unless he has got severe COPD underlying, then SATs of 93% on air are, are less. So there's no harm giving them oxygen. So patient is stable, although he is stable, but he does need some oxygen. Right? Okay. So the 12 lead ECG, what sort of MI is it showing? Question is, the 12 lead ECG shows an inferior myocardial infarction. So which leads are involved? Uh, Ma'am, there is uh, enteroceptal, uh, there is a diffuse ST elevation in uh, anterior uh, chest leads, in chest leads. Yes, and on the and reciprocal changes so in the inferior lead. Yes. So this is not an inferior am I right? Yes, sir. yes so this is not so this is false. Amiodron should be given immediately upon diagnosis of myocardial infarction to reduce oxygen consumption by the myocardium. Is it true or false? False. 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 Yes. So 55 year old man presents with one hour history of crushing chest pain, nausea and sweating. Pulse rate is 38 beats per minute and blood pressure is 75 over 45. You have observed sinus bradycardia in ECG. So you recommend, would you give atropine 500 mics IV? Yes, ma'am. Yes, you will. Yes? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Adrenaline infusion, uh, yes, 2200 mics per minute is an option. No. Is it right or wrong? Oh, no. False. So what do you give? Atropine. How much adrenaline Atropine. do you give? So adrenaline, you can give. This, this patient is hypotensive and bradycardic. So adrenaline, which is two to 10 yes, micrograms per minute is, yeah, is 2,200. That's not the right dose, but is two to 10 micrograms is the right dose, which slightly brings up the blood pressure. And when the blood pressure is up, you it, it, it helps to bring the pulse rate up. 
but it's a second line treatment the first line is definitely atropine so this the second one is wrong because the dose of adrenaline is wrong but you do give adrenaline you you make it in the syringe and give 2 to 10 mics per minute or or you can titrate according to the blood pressure to see the patient's response anesthesia with opiates is contraindicated blood gases false yes you you can you can give opiates to relieve patient's pain oxygenation 24% should be maintained until abg results arrive and uske paas 24% means um, I think liters? four liters or something, four or five okay. liters of oxygen. Is it right or wrong? I don't know. So this is wrong. The reason it is wrong is 24% oxygen the controlled oxygen you only give in patients who have got underlying um, lung conditions for example copd in this patient who is okay. young and he is compromised so you give them 100% oxygen 15 liters via non rebreathe mask so the more oxygen you give the better it is these 24% 28% via venturi or different you know the controlled way of giving oxygen is for the patients who have got copd or underlying lung conditions and you don't want to give them too much oxygen because they can't exhale copd uh, like carbon dioxide out so you don't want to give them too much oxygen because they will retain co2 then right Okay, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So you, because it's not given in the scenario that whether the patient has got underlying health conditions or whether he's got lung conditions. So in every patient, you give them fifteen liters of oxygen, which is hundred percent. Even fifteen liters, when you give, it's not provide. It does not provide you hundred percent oxygenation because you've got mask, you've got dead space, you've got surrounding air. so it it still does not give you 100% i think with with the with the non rebreathe mask it's still 75% oxygen that you can give if you give 15 liters of oxygen so we can cover this bit if it's bit confusing in our copd when we talk about copd so in this patient this is healthy but he is compromised so what if i say that this patient with a heart rate of 38 and blood pressure of 75 over 45 this is very sick patient do you agree yes yes ma'am so what can you what can you expect from his ecg what can it be if it's not a sinus tachycardia block inferior inferior wall mi plus uh, uh, right ventricular involvement so it can be a second degree heart block which can yeah. go into third degree heart block yeah. or a complete heart block it could be a complete so you heart have block to be yeah mm. complete heart block in that case you have to be very vigilant because this patient is actually peri arrest paracetamol lagana hai or sodium 500 right this patient yeah. so you buy time by giving atropine and in the meantime you connect them with electrodes to get ready your external pacing because this patient can drop their heart rate very quickly and they are already compromised with the blood pressure of 75 so that means their heart is not functioning is not beating properly is not ventilating the patient so you give them oxygen you give them fluids you give them atropine you give them adrenaline to get their blood pressure up and if you see what depends what's on the monitor then they definitely need pacing pacing yeah okay yes so that's all i that i i just could only get these but i can send you some link where you have got more options to do the mcqs online 
and they give you a good idea when you read the explanation and then you will find out. Is everybody happy with that? Yes. So yes, I yes, would uh, recommend to fo start following the pathways. I know the information that I have sent, they have got obviously my hospital details and the numbers at the end and everything. But if you follow just the, the pathways that actually separates three different categories of chest pains, um, then uh, it will help you to decide which patient is needs treating urgently, who can be treated in a moderate way, and who can be safely sent home and brought back to the clinic for further investigations, and who actually needs further investigation and who, who does not need further investigation. The scoring system, keep these things in mind, start applying things, and also please try to keep your patients in the loop and don't hide things from them. Whatever you are doing, keep telling your patients that what is going on, what are you doing, and what are the what are the consequences? It is a very good practice to have to get your patients involved in your decision making and keep them informed about what is happening to them. So from now mm -hmm. onwards, I think all the ER and most when they call medicine consultants in the evening or morning, they should uh, be able to give us a either a hard score. Um, or the actual pathway that they are following, okay? So okay, this sir. is an expectation from us um, as medicine consultants and uh, you, could, you should spread the word also to the other MOs who have not uh, done this video to follow the video and look at the content, okay? Okay, sir. So the that's very video. kind of you. Thank you very much. Um, we can decide the next topic. Um, and the next topic and the next meeting would be next Wednesday, inshallah. And then we will go through some other things. And if you have got any questions regarding the previous uh, lectures or regarding this session, or you can always ask on the group, you can always ask here, we can always discuss things which are bothering you. Okay. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Have a, Thank you, Have a good evening. Thank you very much. Allah Hafiz. Allah Hafiz. Allah Hafiz.